I've got a lot, uh, I've got a lot in my heart this morning. Um, we, I'm going to be talking today about uh, weighing prophecy, weighing prophetic words. This is the, uh, some would say much anticipated part two of the uh, two-part series on the prophetic that I was supposed to do from many months ago. I've had many of you come up and say, hey, when's the part two coming? We're a little late, but this is part two. Um, and I just want to give you guys some of my heart, mine and Sean's heart, and why we talk about the gifts and even why I'm passionate about talking about the gifts and even training people in it is because I just so want every single one of you to actually encounter the Holy Spirit. I grew up going to church. I grew up knowing the Bible. And there was something that happens. I'm not going to pitch, you know, knowing the Bible versus encountering the Holy Spirit. Those two things are something that the church has separated. God never separated those. But my heart, there, there was something distinct that happened in my life when I went just from, okay, like I show up on Sunday, I read my Bible, I do the church thing, and then I go home and I struggle to get through to Sunday, promise Jesus I'm going to do better next week, and then run through. Something shifted in my life when I encountered the power of the Holy Spirit and when I started to delve into the gifts that He gives something shifted in my life. God ceased to be a theological idea to me at that point. And I need some of you to hear that. Some of us live our lives like God is just a theological idea, like he's some truth that we can mentally assent to. He's real and he wants to meet you. So I teach on this stuff because number one, it's in the Bible. It's actually in there. And so much of the church in the West, particularly in America, we treat the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit like an optional extra. We treat it like an optional extra. We have a bad experience. We see somebody who claims to be prophetic or a prophet. They go off the rails. They do something weird. And we make this shift in our hearts where we say, that's weird. I don't know if I want to associate with that. And we just start to back up from it. Like that's a choice we get to make. And what I believe that the Lord's doing in the church right now, and at least with this body, He's teaching us to say, okay, what does the word actually say? How can we move forward with this? How can we not throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, but how can we actually delve into what are the biblical guidelines that the Lord puts in place here? We're going to hit a bunch of different scriptures today. I'm going to reference stuff all over the place. So if you ever want to dive in more to some of what I'm talking about, because again, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground just have notes and just take quick, quick little you know, tidbit notes of what I'm saying so you can go back and research it because what we're going to be doing today when we talk about the prophetic and weighing it, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground. I'm going to be covering Old Testament. I'm going to be covering some New Testament. Uh, I'm even going to be going into a little bit of church history. Uh, and I'm even going to end launching into just where I believe the Lord's taking us as a community. So we're going to be covering, again, a lot of ground today. But this is something that I, I will say, as long as I am one of the leaders here, it, it is my mission to make sure that we as a community can grow in this and steward this well. Because here's the other thing, just to launch into it. How many of you guys want to see more of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, more of the power of God, more of the prophetic, all of that? What scripture teaches us is that in the kingdom, the way that you receive more is by stewarding what he's already given you. Yes. So hold that thought and then consider how many of us actually weigh, pray through, and then act on the prophetic words that we've been given.
This is not to shame, this is to bring some awareness. I want, this is something I, that I need to grow into. But most of us treat the prophetic and prophetic words that we receive, if I'm gonna be honest, we wait until we're feeling really low, we dial up our prophetic friend, say, what's the Lord saying? Or we find another conference to go to, we say, what's the Lord saying? We treat the prophetic like a slot machine, pull the arm, I feel good for another couple of weeks, and then in, a, in honestly not even a week, two days later you forget what that person ever said, and you're back at it. Back to the same old routine. And I would say that scripture actually invites us into something more than that. Yes. Scripture invites us into something more than that, and God actually has more for us in that area. One of the first scriptures we're going to look at is 1 Thessalonians 5, and it's starting in verse 19. You guys know how I, how I speak and how I talk at this point. I'm going to go all over the place. So if something hits you, write it down, grab it, because we're going to be flowing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19 says, Don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. This is at the end of a letter. So typically, if you've read a lot of the New Testament, you start to get an understanding of the flow. Paul sort of starts off with a greeting, gets into the bulk of his point. And then at the end, he sort of throws together, you know, this is all the stuff that I wanted to say that I didn't get a chance to work into the letter. So we're at that point. And when he's writing to the church in Thessalonica, he's saying very clearly, do not despise prophecies. Do not quench the spirit. And as I was reading and doing some research, that phrase, how many of you guys know that Paul in scripture was like, it was written to a particular people and a particular place in a particular time, yeah? So that means that one of the things that we can do is we can actually look at phrases that are used, words that are used, and we can not only look at how they're used in scripture, but look at how they're used in documents from around the same time frame. Because again, like Paul's a part of this culture, he knows the people that he's speaking to. So we can look at how they're using those words and those phrases to get an understanding of what he means. Are you tracking? Make sense? So that phrase, don't quench the spirit, was actually used in a document that was talking about, at that time, the oracle at Delphi. Which for those of you who maybe don't know your Greek mythology or Greek history, this was somebody who was a, a pagan prophet, a prophet of uh, the Greek god Apollo, I believe. And they had noticed that there was actually starting to be a decline in the prophetic, quote unquote, prophetic activity of that oracle. And that same phrase, that quenching of the spirit, is that same phrase that was used. And I bring this up because some of us in our move back away from the prophetic, our move back away from the gifts of the spirit because it's weird, we'll take that don't quench the spirit phrase and sort of apply it generally to a lot of different stuff. And that's fine and it can still mean that, but Paul really is specifically saying how you relate to prophecy and how you relate to prophecy that happens in your community can actually have the effect of quenching the work of the Holy Spirit in your community. And then he moves on to get real specific along that same train of thought, do not despise prophecy. The word despise in English can come across really intense. The gist of that word and what it means is treat as common. Treat flippantly. So there's two ways that we actually do this pretty commonly in charismatic culture. One is what I just described. You get a word, somebody prophesies over you, you don't record it, you don't write it down. You're just kind of like, oh, thank you, thanks God. And you just sort of you know, put it on the back shelf, quote unquote, and then just move about your life. One of the other ways that we treat it as common is when we don't do what Paul says to do next. We don't test it. Because what does that indicate about the position of our hearts? If we believe God's speaking through somebody, he's given a gift to somebody and he's speaking, if we don't 
take the next step to test it, that actually communicates something about where our hearts are at, that we actually don't think that this is all that significant. And some additional context, like some of you are even getting uncomfortable just about me talking about the prophetic. That's fine. That's actually pretty common throughout church history, even all the way back then. That, why do you think Paul had to write these instructions? So you feeling uncomfortable with it, you being like not sure about it, that's a very normal response. You don't get to stay there, however. Because <laughs> some of what was going on in the church in Thessalonica, if you read through that whole book, you'll see that Paul's starting to talk to people about the day of the Lord, which is you know Christ's second coming and what it's going to look like. So what we can basically piece together that, is that there were these people who were prophesying and they were saying stuff that actually wasn't in line with what God had already revealed about Jesus' second coming. So if we take that and we piece it together with these instructions, we can you know, basically surmise, okay, these people are starting to hear some weird prophetic stuff go on. So they're starting to actually shut down the prophetic when it's popping up because they're like, I don't know about this. I don't, this is weird. This doesn't seem to line up. And they're shutting it down and Paul says, look, I understand that it's weird. I understand that it's a little bit off. He actually goes to some lengths. First Thessalonians is five chapters. This is one instruction at the very end. So the bulk of that book is him giving instructions and breaking down why what's being said isn't correct. But he says, you don't actually get to just shut this down. Out of the, out of the options that you have available to you and how you relate to this gift and how you relate to the Lord speaking through the prophetic, you just shutting it down and choosing to not engage with it is not an option that you have. Biblically. What does he say to do? Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. So this is where we're going to start covering a lot of ground. So th this teaches us a few different things about the prophetic. And I'll give some examples. But number one... A lot of us come in to an understanding of the prophetic, particularly when you're newer to it, particularly if you, you were like me and you have a background with denominations and church cultures that didn't believe really in the supernatural. You come into the, pro the prophetic with this understanding of like, somebody says something, it is gonna word for word, verbatim, happen exactly the way they said it. And it's essentially like, you know, God overshadows them and sort of uses them like a Muppet and everything that they're saying is like, that's all God, there's no human involvement. And so we basically can just take it and run with it. But the fact that Paul says here, test all things, and even in 1 Corinthians, which we're going to get to in a moment, where he says, let two or three prophets speak and the others judge way what's being said. If there's no room for human error for the, the effect of your own emotions and your own soul getting involved in the message that's being declared. If there's no possibility of that, then why does God give an instruction to weigh and judge the prophetic word? He even goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, he says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Which in that context means, you know, we can read, through, read between the lines. We had people in the church in Corinth who, again, if, if Paul's spending three whole chapters basically to talk about gifts and order and how they actually function, you can imagine that the gifts and the activity of the Holy Spirit was popping off in Corinth. And Paul says, we're not actually going to come and shut this down, but we need to bring a little bit of structure and understanding to this. And he says, let them judge and weigh what is said. Are you guys thinking or you're giving me some deer in the headlights right now? <laughs> I know for a lot of us, this is stuff we haven't necessarily thought about. So that's okay. But even the fact that he's saying the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets means that you very likely have people saying, well, I'm not, I'm not responsible for what I said. God was just taking over. And he's like, mm, no. Nope, that's not how that works. And even 
in scripture, the, the discerning of spirits, that gift gets paired often with the prophetic. So when somebody's delivering a prophetic word, it's actually then our responsibility. I'm doing a lot of wind up before I get to actually how we weigh a prophetic word. It's actually then our responsibility to weigh what is said and not just what is said, but what the source of that inspiration is. Are you tracking with me? Because you actually see in the book of Acts, just as an example, Paul's walking through a city and then there's this girl who has the spirit of divination that starts to follow him around. And for three days, she's shouting really loudly, you know, listen to these men. They declare to you the way of salvation. And most of us would think, I guess God's really moving. This is like, we're, we're used to getting beat and chased out of cities. And now people are welcoming us and like giving us free press, basically inviting them to a revival meeting. Like, this is awesome. But then Paul, after a few days, turns around, rebukes the demon that's in her that was giving her the ability to discern what she was discerning. And then she gets free. What does that tell us? A couple of things. One of the things is that discerning and judging a prophetic word on whether it's correct or not isn't just about whether or not the content is accurate. Because was what that girl was saying true? Yes. It was. Not a trick question. It was true. But the spirit that was operating in her, that was empowering her to see and discern all of that, was not the Holy Spirit. This is where and why playing with things like tarot cards, psychics, Ouija boards, all of that stuff is dangerous. A lot of us, because you know, we, we grow up in a Western worldview that basically says anything that has any sort of spirituality to it, basically writes, as, writes it off as foolishness. So you grow up under that and you look at those things, you know, Ouija boards, tarot cards, what have you, and you basically write it off as a parlor trick. And that can and does happen. However, if you not only look at those, but you look at the rest of the world, the rest of the world is very keen and very understanding of like, yeah, there are these people who can discern, who can say, predict things accurately, but the accuracy of what they're saying doesn't mean it's from the Holy Spirit. Are you tracking with me? So this is one of the reasons why we need to weigh prophetic words. So we can, we can agree that that needs to happen, yeah? So I'm just going to run through some scenarios and then I'm going to actually give you some practical examples from my own life and just the life of our church. So when you look at, the, look at a prophetic word, there's actually three parts to it. A lot of times what we focus on is just the revelation itself. That's the, the part one. That's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago when I came up and I was talking about, you know, you can all prophesy. Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 14, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And even in Joel 2, where Peter stands up and is saying, you know, that the activity and the giving of the spirit means that there's actually a prophetic spirit in you called the Holy Spirit. And whether or not you believe you have that gift, you have the one who inspires prophecy living in you. So you can actually learn to hear his voice and say what he's saying. But that's just the part one. There's a revelation, part two, there's an interpretation, and part three, there's an application. How many of you guys have spent much time reading through the Old Testament? Okay, we got a few of you. How many of you guys don't spend a lot of time reading the Old Testament because you're confused by what you read in there? Yeah, so this is case in point, right? They're receiving a revelation. There's a lot of a lot of pictures, a lot of allegory, particularly if you want to talk New Testament and you go to the book of Revelation, you read a lot of stuff. You're like, why is there a beast with like all these horns and these heads? And why, are, why do some of them have crowns? And what's with these horses? And you're like, what's going on? That's the perfect, you, you know, it, it illustrates my point. There's the revelation, but then you have to do the work of interpretation, which is where you start bringing in the weighing of the prophetic. Because I can see one thing. God can show me something, 
but I can't assume that I naturally am going to have the, the interpretation for it in that moment. Just one quick example. This was years back. Uh, I was praying for a young woman and I, I had my hand on her and I was just praying and the Lord was showing me a, a bunch of different pictures of flowers. And I, you know, if you've been sort of in prophetic circles for a while, you're like, okay, every, m most people have received a word about flowers or seen a picture, like you're kind of, it's, you know, charismatic cheesy a little bit. So I'm giving her the word and some of the stuff that the Lord's talking to me about based on what I'm seeing. And then as soon as I'm done and I say, amen, she pulls her phone out and she starts flipping through photos. And then she actually shows me probably 30 plus photos of these individual flowers that she had taken on her phone. She said, the Lord for like the past month has been highlighting these things to me. Just as I'm like out on my walks, as I'm going through my day-to-day -day life, he's highlighting these individual flowers to me. So I had received the revelation and I had some of the interpretation, but I had no way of knowing that the Lord was actually not only giving me a message through that, but he was actually giving a word of knowledge about something specific that was happening in her life. Are you understanding what I'm saying? She actually, like I was saying one thing and it was still good, but it actually went that much deeper and I had to be open to that in the giving of the word and in allowing the word to be judged. So we have the revelation, we have the interpretation, but then there's the application. How many of you guys realize that timing is important? <laughs> timing is everything. One of the clear Old Testament pictures that we can look at is Abraham. Some of you already know where I'm going with this. God gives him this word. You're going to be a father of many nations and there's going to be a son born to you. He waits about 13 years. And then he and his wife, Sarah, say, I think I'm done waiting. I think we need to just make this happen. And what is that birth? That birth's Ishmael which if you track biblical history becomes a whole nation that ends up being a thorn in the side of Israel, even to this day. And God even comes and tells him as much. This was not the promised son. He had the revelation, right? He had the interpretation, right? But because he got impatient and chose to force the application in a way that he wanted, he ended up creating more problems for himself. Here's an interesting one to think about too. Most of us know David and Bathsheba, yeah? We understand that story. At the beginning of that story, there's this phrase that says, in the time when other kings were going out to war, David was at home. And somebody, like, I had to sit under some teaching and somebody pointed this out to me. One of the key pieces of the, the Davidic covenant, the promise that God made with David was, I will give you rest from your enemies on all sides. So one way that we can actually think about and look at David being where he wasn't supposed to be was he was out of season. He had the right word, the right, interpreta the right interpretation, but he was out of season with his application. He said, no, God's gonna give me rest for my enemies on all sides, but then him being out of season with the application puts him in the wrong place in the wrong time, and he starts making, to be fair, his own sinful decisions about what happens with Bathsheba. But if he was in season with the application of the prophetic word, he wouldn't have been there. And this, all these different variables, is one of the big reasons why weighing the prophetic word is important. Easy example from my own life. How many of you guys know my oldest boy, Jacob? You've seen him running around. Yeah. Mine and Amanda's plan going into marriage was that we were going to wait, I think, it was, what was it, five years? 
We were going to wait about three years before even starting to have the conversation about kids. So I, you know, I'm very passionate about the prophetic. I'm passionate about pursuing it, learning how to help other people step into it. So I end up going to this conference. Uh, they called it School for Prophetic Trainers uh, up at the Mission in Vacaville. And I go by myself and I'm not anticipating seeing anybody there that I know, none of that. And then I go and there ends up being uh, this lady who I had met through different ministry trips that I've gone on. Her name's Kim Moss, Dr. Kim Moss. She's awesome. Uh, if you, I, I share names, just as a side note, I share names like that because I know that when you start delving into the prophetic, just in general, it can sort of feel like the Wild West in terms of, you know, like, who can I trust? Who can I not? Who's a good voice? Who's not? So I share names like that just to say, put a little asterisk, she's a good one. So if you want to look it up, she's a good one to follow. Um, but anyway, she's there. So me being naturally a little bit more introverted, I find somebody no, I glom onto her, sit next to her through all the activations and everything. And, we, you know, we start going to this time where we're practicing the gifts of prophecy. We're praying over each other. She's praying over me. She gives me this word. And at the end, she kind of tags it in, tags on like, and I usually don't ever talk about this, but are you guys pregnant? And I'm like, only if Amanda's not telling me something. <laughs> and so, you know, she says that, and I'm kind of like, okay, just tuck it, tuck it away. Next day, there's a, another minister there, a guy by the name of uh, Richie Seltzer. Um, and I end up being in a group with him, and he's praying for me. He and Kim have not talked. And towards the end of what he's praying over me, he says, like, and, and are you guys pregnant? And I'm like, apparently some people know something I don't know. <laughs> so there was a little bit of confirmation there, right? So part of what we did in terms of weighing that prophetic word, because here, here's the other thing. Um, as you delve into the supernatural and as you delve into the prophetic, you're going to have to be okay with being wrong and you're going to have to be okay with allowing the Lord to change your mind on things based on what he shows you in scripture. Oftentimes when I teach the prophetic and I was a big proponent of this and I held this really firm for a long time, the, the cutesy phrase is no mate states or babies. Don't, don't go prophesying to people about, you know, who their husband and wife is going to be. Don't, you know, say such and such is going to happen by this day, this time. Don't talk about kids. And while there can be some wisdom to that, especially when you're starting out, that phrase realistically exists because by and large, there are not cultures of weighing and testing prophetic words. I'll say that. And both because this happened in my own life and because as I look through scripture, like that's not a scriptural rule. Lots of dates. Lots of babies. So part of how we were weighing that prophetic word was I came home each day and I told Amanda and we were both like, well, shoot, I guess we got to like think about this. So we, we said, Lord, it seems like you're starting to say something. We, you get to choose how our family happens and how this starts. We, we just ask because we don't want to rush into anything hastily. We just ask for confirmation. And over the next, it was two weeks. We had eight people in two weeks, all separate from each other. Yeah, all, all separate from each other, both come, all come up and say, are you guys having a baby? Hey, I had a dream last night. Are you, are you, guys, are you guys pregnant? Hey, like I was praying for you and the Lord showed me, and was like, are you, are you guys having a baby soon? After four, we were like, okay, I think I get it. But then the Lord, you know, sometimes he likes to drive his point home a little bit. <laughs> so part of that process was saying, like, God, we're, we're submitting this to you. We're talking about this with people that, you know, we trust and that we love and that love us and know us and know what we're called to, know how you've wired us. What does this look like? Because here's some of what all of this means. And even as we look at scripture, um, you writing off a word 
because it's inconvenient to you or because it makes you uncomfortable is not the same thing as weighing it. Because there's, there's a whole movement that exists within the prophetic and within charismatic streams where the moment there's anything that sounds like it could be possibly even the tiniest bit negative, they're like, no, 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 that's not God. He doesn't talk like that. And they'll cite 1 Corinthians 14, you know, prophecy exists for encouragement, edification, you know, lifting up, building up the body. And all of that is true. Um, edification and encouragement can look like you need to stop acting the fool. And you can even see this in, not just in Old Testament context, in the New Testament context. How many of you guys remember a guy named Agabus in Acts? All four of you who have read the book of Acts. <laughs> There's a word that goes out about a famine that's going to affect the whole world. And the church judges that word accurate. And starts then, this is the application portion, starts then taking up collections so that they can send money to the poor believers in Jerusalem. This is actually what, had, what was one part of all of Paul's missionary journeys. It wasn't just the going out to preach the gospel. It's I'm going to go preach the gospel and visit churches that we've already established because the Lord's saying that there's this famine coming and we need to be able to collect funds to take care of the people who, when this happens, won't be able to take care of themselves. If your rubric for whether or not it's a good word is just whether or not it makes you feel good, you're going to write the famine word off. Just while we're on Agabus. <laughs> we'll go there. This goes back to application, and even revelation a little bit. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people, particularly those who grew up cessationist like I did. They didn't believe that God still spoke through the prophetic, and they get really zeroed in on, like, everything has to happen exactly down to, like, the hair follicle, exactly the way that this person said. Otherwise, they're a false prophet, stone them, you know, the whole deal. something you have to consider. Agabus, written down in scripture, scripture still calls him a prophet, got like 99% of a word correct that he gave to Paul. When Paul's getting ready to go to Rome, and it says all the way while he's making his trip to Rome, it says that he keeps getting warned by the Spirit, meaning people are coming up to him giving him prophetic words. Hey, if you go to Rome, you're going to die. So here's even an application piece. They're assuming that because they're discerning that, that the right application is you need to run the other way and not go. And Paul says, no, this is actually confirmation that I'm headed to where I'm supposed to go. But Agabus comes to Paul. He walks up. He does the typical weird prophet thing starts enacting a word, takes off his own belt, or sorry, takes off Paul's belt, ties up his own hands and feet, and he prophesies and he says, thus says the spirit of the Lord that this is what the Jews will do to the person who owns this belt. And if you follow his story, there's two points where he's not, again, if you're somebody who says it has to be 100% down to the last iota accurate, the Jews were actually getting ready to kill him, and the Romans were the ones who interrupted and actually took him away. The Jews didn't hand him over. The Romans had to interrupt. The Jews were ready to kill him. That's number one. And number two, he's bound with chains. He's not bound with his own belt. And really, if I'm going to get to the heart of why this makes some of us uncomfortable um, is I think we really want to feel like we can understand what God does and how he's doing it all the time. 
which if you drill down on that a little bit further is about control. And even what we read in 1 Thessalonians, the spirit can be quenched. And even if you move further on and look to the life of Jesus, Jesus comes to his hometown and it says that he was not able to perform many miracles there because of their unbelief. Which means what? means that they experienced a small fraction of what God had available to them because of their own offense and their own unbelief towards the person of Jesus. We can go through our whole Christian lives, barely engaging with the prophetic, distancing ourselves from it because let's face it, prophetic people are weird, self-deprecating, And the Lord is kind and gracious enough to say, if you make that choice, I will honor that choice. But we will cut ourselves off from so much of what is actually available to us and what he wants to bless us with. I don't want that for myself. I don't want that for our family. And here's where we even get into like this black and white, either or thinking. We, we feel like because we talk this way that we have to all of a sudden run with every single thing that somebody brings to us. No, you don't. Scripture says, weigh it. Do not despise it. Hold fast to what is good. That means there's some stuff that's going to run across your life. People are going to be saying things. You weigh it in community. You weigh it against Scripture, number one. And you're like, you know, some of this is good, but some of this feels really off. So what does scripture say? Hold fast to what is good. Not kick out the whole word because you didn't like one part. Am I giving you guys something to think about? Okay. One more example. And this is actually going to lead us into uh, what our next sermon series is going to be starting next week. I was sitting at home just maybe a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and sitting and I'm just having my devotional, my quiet time, and the Lord comes in and it was soft and it was gentle, but I, I heard this very clearly in my heart. And he said, the rock of Roseville is about to walk into a three month period of radical receiving. And so, and we, we honestly didn't plan this, how this worked out, but in, in just us keeping with scripture, weighing and testing the word, it ended up being a perfect example for how this works. So I didn't receive that word and then immediately jump on social media to do a live and, you know, tell all my people. I, I held on to that. I was meditating on it. And then Sean, Amy, Amanda, and I have our retreat. We went away for a week and night. And one of the points that I made to bring up in our talks was like, hey, I think this is what the Lord is saying. This is what I received. What do you guys think about that? And even in that conversation, that conversation was immediately rich. Like one of the other things, you know, we, we talk about weighing the prophetic word just in terms of rules and strictures, but one of the things that happens when you do that is when it's a good word and the Lord's speaking is all of a sudden it becomes so much deeper and richer than just even what was delivered at face value. Because we start digging into like, what does it mean to receive, but then what does it mean to radically receive? And we're going to start talking about this, but out of that conversation, we started talking about how radically receiving means that at some point you're going to have to rearrange how you do life to make room to receive. Because it's one thing to just go through your day-to-day -day life, God will give you something and you'll receive it, but to radically receive. 
that word radical even means to start to shift and change the fundamental nature of a thing. So if you're going to start receiving something, if we're going to start receiving something from the Lord that's going to radically, at the root nature of who we are and how we operate, change things, we're going to have to make space for it. So this all starts to come out of the conversation. And even though that conversation's good, we say like, hey, we, we understand that it can be really easy to get even caught up in some of the hype and emotionalism around, you know, that, that momentum that you feel. So let's just take a week. We come back oh, roughly a week later. I check in like, hey, where are we at on this? Because one of the things that we had to wrestle through was the, applic the application portion, right? Because the Lord just said, hey, three-month period, this is what I'm doing. And he left it at that. So then we as leadership have to wrestle through is like, okay, so what does the application for that look like? Do we just, you know, re release it and like post it on the website? Do we just, you know, release it and say, you guys can do with this what you want? And as we wrestle through, we're like, no, we think that the Lord wants us to spend some time on this and actually talk about it, which is giving birth to, this is going to be the, the sermon series that we're on through to the end of the year, starting next week. And there's going to be invitations for, for all of us. Because here's, I'm just going to drop this nugget because I love how the Lord, Lord talks about stuff like this. Um, one of the things that gets challenged in receiving is that the Lord immediately bumps up against our own sense of worthlessness. How many of you guys have ever received like a really extravagant gift from somebody? How many of you guys, it made you super uncomfortable? That's the Lord pushing up against. Like we, we actually, because of our own belief that we're unworthy, even though the blood of Jesus declares something different, we actually, when the Father wants to pour out, we step back. Because we say, I'm, you want to give me that? I'm not worthy of that. I don't think you understand. And all of that, that we just talked about, all that we're going to walk into, happened because we honored a biblical process of, God, you gave a revelation, give us some interpretation, What's the application? And this gets super practical. I'm going to land the plane here soon, hopefully. It's usually when, when the pastor speaks for another 30 minutes. I'll try not to do that. <laughs> some practical steps, because I've talked a lot about a lot of big concepts, but some practical steps. If somebody's giving you a prophetic word, they're praying over you and you're like, hey, I feel like the Lord is saying this or he's showing me this. Ask them to pause. Most of us have smartphones. Your smartphone has this awesome thing called a recording app. <laughs> Grab your phone, pull out the recording app, just record it. Because as much as you think it's the most impactful thing that you've ever heard and your life's going to be changed and you're never going to forget that, you will forget tomorrow. <laughs> Personal experience. So pull it out, record it. Recording it then allows you to actually, well, a couple of things. Number one, it allows you to actually be in the moment and just receive instead of having to, you know, try to dissect everything while it's happening, which actually becomes a barrier to receiving in and of itself. It allows you to receive what's happening in the moment. Then you can go back and you can be diligent. You can compare it against the, the scriptures, you can compare it against other words that you've received. You can compare it again. You can share it with friends and family who know you and care about you, who can say like, yeah, that's actually in line with who I see you to be. And I think God's calling you to something more. Or they can say, maybe, but I don't know about the timing. Or they can say, that was just bad. You should delete that right now. And all of this, if we can just commit to doing these simple things and stewarding and weighing the word of the Lord, you will see God start to pour out in this area. For some of you, it's your dreams. 
you would be surprised the amount of people that I talk to that dream every single night and can say, yeah, a lot of these dreams come true within the next couple of days or a week. And most of, the, most of you, I love you, most of you do not write them down. And as somebody who dreams maybe twice a year, I am irked. <laughs> Seriously, I dream maybe twice a year and I ha here's the other weird thing, like just how God does stuff. I dream maybe twice a year, but I get texts probably anywhere between like four to 10 in a, in a given month of people reaching out to me and asking for help interpreting their dream. No, do not. It's good. So some, just, just for my own, you know, my, my own sake, just write your dream down. <laughs> write the word down. Even if it feels slight. When I tell you that I, I always pictured when, you know, because I, I knew at some point the Lord would bring me to this spot where I'd be giving prophetic words in a more public way. I always pictured what that experience would be like. And I thought it was like, you know, I'd be living in the third heaven. Like angels are following me around, like all this other stuff. I thought that's what it would be like. And when I tell you that it's really pretty normal most of the time. Even that word about radical receiving, it was small, it was quiet, but it was clear. And I couldn't have known how it was going to start to shake thing, shape things for our body. And I still don't know. We're looking at three months worth of the Lord starting to do things in our lives and do things corporately and even break things open as we spend time in the sermon series that's coming talking about this stuff. But, but if I'm pre-judging the word before taking it to community, none of that opens up. So my last encouragement to you is don't allow your assumptions of what it's supposed to look like or feel like prevent you from stepping out and risking. I could keep talking, but I think the Lord wants to do some stuff, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet now. Um, if you guys could stand... Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> if you all can just stick your hands out in front of you, nothing magical about this, but what we do with our physical bodies sometimes is a way that we can tell our hearts it's time to start receiving now. Um, I can, the Holy Spirit's already moving in here. Um, there, there's a couple of things that I think he wants to do. The, the first is that I think there's an opportunity for some of us to uh, repent for how we've treated the prophetic as common. We've, we've despised prophecy, to quote, again, 1 Thessalonians. And here's, here's, as I've been meditating on this this week, here's something that the Lord keeps bringing up to me. Um, cynicism and discernment are not the same thing. Cynicism and discernment are not the same thing. Discernment will prevent you from stepping into a bad word, but it will also propel you into a good one. Cynicism will stand back and say, God has to prove to me that this is going to happen before I say yes with it. So for some of us, it's saying, God... I repent for putting you in a box and I repent for treating as common something that you wanted to give me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Some of what I believe that he's wants to do in this moment, I believe he wants to release impartation.
So if you, right now, if you feel the Lord moving on you, that could be, some of you, it's a gift of tears. Some of you just started weeping a few minutes ago and you don't understand why there's tears coming out. Some of you, it's, this is nothing crazy spiritual. This is just what I've seen happen sometimes when I talk about this. Some of you, your one of your ears is actually like burning hot right now out of nowhere. And some of you, you're feeling the Lord like touch you physically. That could feel like a weight, that could feel like electricity, that could feel like power. If any of those things are you, or you just feel the Lord moving on you, can you lift a hand? All right, keep it, keep it lifted up. So I want you guys to look around and just put a hand on them. I'll, I'll pray, I'll lead us in praying right now, but I want you to put a hand on them. More Holy Spirit. More Lord. More Lord. More Lord. Some of you just need to surrender and let him touch you. Some of you are holding back because you're afraid of making a scene. You need to just let him touch you. This isn't about you. This is about what the Lord wants to pour out. So Father, we just say more. God, we thank you for the gift of prophecy that you give to the church and the gift of discernment. Father, we thank you that you're releasing greater measures of a prophetic anointing. We thank you that you're releasing greater measures of a discerning of spirits. We ask for your presence to come and to fill these ones that you're marking right now. Fill these ones that you're marking right now. And God, even as I've started to make breakthrough in this area, for every person who you're touching, I declare a breaking off of the fear of man in Jesus' name. I break off of you the fear of what people are gonna say when you say what you're seeing. And I loose your tongue in Jesus' name to say the words that the Lord's putting in you and on you. Um, for some, there, there's something on the women too. Father, right now in Jesus' name where women have been silenced because of structures that they grew up under, we break those yokes in Jesus' name. And we just say that God has put his words in your mouth, his spirit inside of you. And we declare a breaking off of every ceiling that human beings have put on you, that God did not put on you. In Jesus' name. More Lord. If you're feeling the Lord moving on you and you've got people who are laying hands on you, I wanna actually invite you to come forward. Um, we're gonna start to close the service here in a moment, but I want us to create some space to just continue to receive. A lot of times we, we move past some of the stuff the Lord wants to pour out because we, we feel like we have to keep to a schedule. So if the Lord's ministering to you on this and you feel like he's releasing something, I want you to just come forward. Um, and prayer team, some of you might be on the prayer team, but uh, I just want you to, like pastors, elders, prayer team members, I want you to start going around and laying hands on people and just agreeing with what the Lord's doing. Don't get too caught up on any single person, but just agree with what he's doing. Just put a hand on and just ask him for more. Ask him to keep touching. Ask him to keep filling. There's one more that, uh, that I want to call out. And then I want to, I actually want us to go into a little bit of worship and then we'll close. But um, there are a lot of people, you'd be surprised the amount, who actually grow up with an ability to see in the spirit. And you, you actually spend a lot of your life thinking that you're nuts and you actually are scared sometimes by what you see, but you can see angels, you can see demons. I know I'm 
For some of you, this is a little out there. Just hang with me. But there are a lot of you who God has that gift on you and you've allowed the fear of some of the things that you've seen to silence you. If that's you, I want you to come forward. I'm not gonna make you raise your hand, but some of you, like the Lord actually wants to set you free from some of the fear and he wants to release you into something new. So at this point, um, we're just going to continue to allow the Lord to move here. But at this point, I'm going to have the official close of service. So if you need to go, you need to pick up your kids, be released to do that. Um, I do ask that if you want to visit with people just to honor what the Lord's doing in here in the moment, if you want to visit with people, I just ask that you take it to the lobby. Um, so be blessed. If you want to stay and participate with what is happening here, if you want to receive more, even if you didn't feel like any of those words that I gave resonated with you in terms of how the Lord's moving on you, but you want to receive more, please come and get prayer. If you need healing, please come and get prayer. Um, otherwise, God bless you. Be released. You can go pick up your kids and you can fellowship with each other in the lobby. Love you guys.